Hey everybody, this is Darwin Reina, the Festival Director of Hospitalage over again International Film Festival. And today, today I'm very excited. I have a great guest. You know, for me, it's a privilege that he accept this, uh, this interview. We have Michael and we have the fixer in the in our festival. So, Michael, how are you? Uh, very good, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Michael, for being with us. We really appreciate it. Uh, I'm very impressed. I know that you were very impressed with your film. Uh, I know you, you wrote it, right? Where do you get the uh, yes. idea from? It's a beautiful idea, actually. Tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> The idea is, is, that's a great question and, and, a, and a really good story. Um, as a writer, um, uh, Lawrence Kasdan said it best probably, as a writer, it's like having homework for the rest of your life every night, right? right? So um, what he means is that we're always working and we're always working because there's always potentially a story you know, around the corner. I mean, I could go to the grocery store and I could be observing somebody, you know, picking uh, an avocado and then putting it back and, and, and inspecting an avocado for five minutes, that becomes a character. Right. Um, so for the fixer, it was really accidental. I, um, I went to a nearby taco stand in Los Angeles where I live. And um, I, I, you know, I've been there many times and I went and I ordered some uh, lengua tacos and I sat down and that's when I realized that I had forgotten my smartphone in my car. And, you know, normally what we would do is we would, you know, take out the phone and we'd be scrolling through our social media or whatever. But um, in that particular moment, I, I decided just to observe my environment. And um, as I was eating and drinking a Mexican Coke, I noticed uh, that the clientele was completely um, Latino. And that's not right. strange at all in Los Angeles. And I'm incredibly uncomfortable. I'm totally comfortable in that environment. My, my wife is, is Mexican-American. Uh, I've, I've married into an ethnic family. So I, I do understand intimately what it is to be an outsider. Also how it's not always a smooth transition to marry into an ethnic family. I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, uh, but I also over time was in my wife's family was completely accepted. And so I started thinking about like, what would I start liking that idea? I wanted to explore a narrative that had to deal with acceptance um, and also forgiveness and and um, and redemption. But I wanted to to make a genre film. I didn't want to just make uh, another drama. I want I'm interested in crime and thriller and, I, and that's sort of my sensibility. So I, as I'm sitting at this taco stand, I'm thinking like, what a cool idea. I was just imagining if I was the outsider and the family was a, was a mafia family, specifically a Mexican mafia family because of Los Angeles. And I happened to be eating tacos and I was this guy and there happened to be a body in the, the trunk of my car. But you know, like I'm just still, that's my normal day, right? I, I go and pick up a dude, I stick him right. in my trunk, but I'm stopping, get a couple tacos and I hang out with my family which is part of like a part of Los Angeles is very Latino. Okay. So to be, I like the idea of, of exploring uh, something that I think everyone can relate to these ideas of acceptance because we either are accepted or we're striving to achieve acceptance. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's, maybe it's between a, a, a parent and a child, right? A child really just wants to be loved and accepted. Um, but then, you know, I thought like, uh, uh, what a cool idea to kind of, you know, make it more natural with, uh, with the mafia world. And so that, that's how Jack Cross, the character of Jack Cross was born really. Right. And that's the main character in the story was just me eating tacos because I forgot my smartphone. Wow. Wow. Michael. Yeah. I mean, you see, we get ideas from all over the place, right? Like you just say, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's amazing. How many... How many drafts do you make of the fixer? Do you remember before you got your story straight? How do you work with the story as well? Do you get feedback from people when you have the script ready or is your, your intuition? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, a really good question. A lot of times you hear writers say things like, write every day. Um, I, I don't do that. Um, it's not my process. I'm more of a a binge writer, okay? When I say that, I mean, like, as far as my fingers hitting the keys and creating script pages, 
I don't do that every day, but I am, as I said earlier, I am working all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the literal answer to your question is how many, how long did it take to write the script? How many drafts? After that taco stand, I literally went home and I began writing and I was done in two days. Okay. Now, but that's not, that's not really accurate because I've also have lots of life experience. I know, uh, you know, so much of the research is already done because I know what it is like to be in this Mexican world. Uh, you know, the many, many, many evenings on a Saturday night, um, I've been in a garage uh, in Echo Park um, with my father-in-law surrounded by 20 other, you know, Mexican guys in their in their 60s and 70s watching boxing matches and I'm the only gringo like my whole life pretty much the last 20 years I'm always the only white guy in the room so you know because so much of the the atmosphere the world like I know what the kitchen looks like I know what the garage looks like I uh, as far as the environment and the world that I want to explore I already know that that's intimately ingrained in my body right um, and then it's just a matter of, you know, uh, putting down and, and I knew that I wanted to make a, a short, what we call a proof of concept. So I was thinking as a producer, as I was writing it, I wanted to be able to, well, my goal was to make a, a short that was self-contained that would have success in the festival film circuit, but I would also be able to use it as a marketing tool to help pitch the television series, which I'm, I'm currently mm -hmm. Uh, I've, I've done the, the pilot script is finished. Uh, series Bible ready to go. We'll, we'll, my my uh, representation will take it out in January. But at the same time, you know, when you're doing something like that, you have to be smart about it. Like you can't make, you can't have a car chase in the middle of the whole thing. You can't have, you know, like an explosion just because, uh, you know, you have to think about budget. You have to think about location. So I wanted, even though I say it took me two days to write, all that life experience is already part of the research. But then begin, before I begin writing, I'm thinking, okay, I want limited characters. So I decided four characters. I want it to be one guy's story. So I knew that before I did anything. And I wanted limited locations that I knew I could uh, get for free or for cheap. And that would have create different environments within one location. So when you see the film, I'm not ruining anything, but there is five locations. The only company move is to a cemetery. The other four locations are all the same location, but it doesn't feel like you're in the same location. Yeah. You know, and so like that's already in my head before I begin. And so now I have, so that's the producing and the directing part. Then when it comes to the writing part, it's just a matter of, you know, it's just putting the time in. You know, you're like, hey, how do you become a good writer? Uh, 20 years of practice. <laughs> you know you just gotta answer. keep doing it like yeah like how do you become a musician well you know play an instrument for 20 years then you'll be good right like anything right. um you know i always tell people um, like that say like well what about somebody like lebron james right well what you forget forget is yes he's a great basketball player but at 18 he's drafted he picked up a ball when he was like two or three so he's got 15 years of experience before he's even 18 so that's really the secret is have a lot of experience doing what it is you're doing. Uh, and then, you know, have a plan when you sit down and do it. Now, the second part of your question, right. I did five drafts, but those were all really polished drafts. The way mm -hmm. I write, generally my first drafts read like, you know, right. third or fourth draft. So, hey, Michael, before we go into production, hey, tell me, how long was the process of pre-production for a, I mean, I call it, when we watch the Judah and me, we call this like a Hollywood thing, you know, it looks, pretty good the taste of the camera how how, how long was that pre-production to make this beautiful sure um do you remember the pre-production yeah yeah it, the whole pre-production was probably by maybe about three months mm -hmm. but uh, i would say the the most of that was casting um and the, that was really the hardest part you know i i uh i had uh it's getting the locations was was not difficult um you know, the cemetery was the only thing that was a little bit more challenging, but we just had to go through the process of, of you know, getting, having the official permits uh, because there's two, two driving sequences. Um, you know, we still had to get permits to drive mm -hmm. the streets. We needed police escorts and that sort of thing, but that's really just right. paperwork. Mm -hmm. And um, 
so I don't know if you have a different question about casting, but, but that's really yeah. was the yeah okay so we're going there yeah exactly I okay, want to yeah. surprise but I want to hear it for you because this is exciting for me so let's go into production yeah how do you cast this beautiful cast I'm impressed I mean <laughs> Jesse Jesse is great and Danny Trejo I mean how do you manage to get this Michael if you can cheat a little bit to us that would be amazing yeah yeah okay well um sometimes when I write. I have a particular actor in mind and sometimes I don't. Okay. So it, um, in the case of, of J Jack Cross, the main character, I had nobody particularly in mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the first draft, that one I said, I wrote in two days, um, the original Benny Benito Sanchez, the character Denny Trejo plays was a woman. And then when I was reading it and I didn't get any feedback from it, I just, you know, I was reading it. And I, and I have enough experience that I can step away from something, then look back at it objectively. And then I was reading it and I was thinking, okay, how do I make this better without making any major changes? And I thought, oh, let's play, let's, let's play against the stereotype, you know, the stereotype of the Mexican woman who is the homemaker. And that's my mother-in-law. I mean, she 100% is that person, right? And so it's real. But I thought, okay, what if I made but uh, uh, Beatrice was originally her name. What if I made Beatrice Benny? What if I just made him a guy? And then immediately within a second, I thought, oh, Danny Trejo. So I rewrote the role in the second draft with him in mind. Never really expecting that I oh. would get him, but that, that was all part of the writing process. So then when I was ready to take it out to actors, um, the second part of that question is, you cannot go get an A-list actor like that. And, um, and, and Danny Trejo is is big time, but partly because he's big time when it comes to movies and TV, and, and, but he's also a brand in of himself, okay? Like, especially in Los Angeles, he's got restaurants and yeah. <laughs> donut shops, and you can go to the grocery store and get like Trejo Cervezo, like you can get beer mm -hmm. with his name on it, right? So I knew that if I could get him, it would help market the film as well. Um, but you, there's no way you could get somebody like that unless you have representation. So fortunately I do. Mm -hmm. And then it's just yeah, sort of a, using the gatekeepers, right? So my manager went out to his agent um, and there was a lot of, you know, I, I can't talk to him directly. So everything is between these people, right? I tell my manager something and then it goes through a, a, a chain of people and eventually gets to him and so forth. That whole courtship probably took six weeks. And um, at the end of the day, uh, he said yes. And it really... It, and this is a really good advice for anybody that's an aspiring filmmaker. He said, yes, not because of who I am. I'm a first time filmmaker. You know, I've been writing, I have a lot of experience writing, but not as a director. And he said, yes, because of the material, because he loved the script and actors, really good actors. They want to work. With... Danny Trail doesn't need to do a short film from a first time director. There's no benefit for him financially, really. Um, or even with to increase his brand, but he liked the character. He liked the story. He liked what I was doing. He thought it was really good writing. Okay. So my advice to anybody is don't spend a lot of time and energy and money buying tools. When I say tools, I mean, camera equipment and lights and all that stuff. Just go buy a pen, literally like, and paper. Okay. Because right. if you have a great story, a great story can attract great talent and then can attract more money, okay? Because the one, the two things you need to make anything good is content. Hitchcock said it probably better than anyone. He said, the three most important parts of a film are the script, the script, and the script, okay? So you gotta have good material and then the money. But it's way easier to get money uh, if you've got great material. And uh, literally five days before production, he dropped out. Okay, so this is a problem because Wow. I can't reschedule the shoot because Trejo is only available one Saturday for four hours. So when you see the film, Trejo's in two different scenes. And I did that in with him in three and a half hours. I actually wrapped it wow. up, right? So, um, so anyway, I, I went and I got a, a, an amazing casting director. Her name is uh, Farrah West. And 1,500 people uh, auditioned for the role of Jack Cross. And uh, I don't have time to look at all that. So she, she got, broke it down to about like 30 or so people to look at. And this was all done vi uh, virtually. Um, and 
I picked three and then I narrowed down to one, but I was still a little lukewarm about it. And we were going into production in like, like two and a half days or maybe three days. So there's a lot of pressure on me, like to pick my lead. And, uh, she said, you know what, can you give me like 24 more hours? Trust me. I think, you know, there might be a last second, uh, audition. And so, you know, another thing I would tell aspiring filmmakers, trust your instinct. Okay. My head was saying, no, pick your guy right now because we're so close to production. But my gut and my heart was saying, listen to the casting director that she's the expert. So I listened. I said, okay, 24 more hours. Then I got a, a, one more audition and it was Jesse Boyd. And it, when I saw it, I was like, boom, here's my guy. Like right away, <laughs> hey. you know, with, without, yeah. without any question. And what was so interesting in really Providence is he was better than the A-list or TV guy, you know, and, and, and Jesse Boyd is going to explode. Like he, he's, uh, uh an up and coming Hollywood star. He so is. in the next like three good. years, you're going to see him in a whole bunch of stuff. Mike, how was the, how many days of production was, you remember? Two. Two. Which is all, yeah. Wow. And so like, you know, Man. okay, so, Uh, yeah, so when you, you see did it, magic, you yeah. did magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like when you see this My film, God. you're gonna be like, if you know that it's two days, because it's five locations, uh, a celebrity A list star, like I said, that I only have for four hours in two different scenes, yeah. um, two driving sequences with police escorts through the streets of LA, uh, a drone shot, and a complete company move to a cemetery, and a dog. And in LA, you can't just throw a dog in a film. Like we had to have like animal monitoring people and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So like, again, I would tell you as a first time director, don't do that because try to make your, your stories as simple as possible. Okay. Now, even though I'm technically a first time director, I have had 20 years of experience yeah. writing for film. Um, I've written over 120 television commercials, you know, that you wouldn't know because uh, we don't get credit for that sort of thing. But um, I'm also incredibly organized. So because I knew that this was going to be my first film, um, I also knew that I had to have I had to have every minute figured out. Okay, so um, if you are going, whatever, whatever the scope of the project is, be prepared. Okay, so like, I, despite that, that was a two day shoot, five locations, complete company move, wow. a list celebrity, police has, I would see with a drone shot and a dog. I wrapped both days early. Right. My best advice is prepare, 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 prepare. <laughs> That's the, uh, Mike, I'm going to call you Mike because I'm so excited, Michael. Uh, <laughs> That's fine. Listen, uh, I have this question that I'm very intrigued because you know, you are, you inspire me actually. Do you, do, do you feel um, uh, intimidated a little bit directing those two stars? What do you think? Okay, oh, so, you... uh, yeah, not at all. Like you have to, no. when you're, okay, yeah. People don't know me, at least not yet, <laughs> <laughs> but people don't know me. People know Danny Trail, right? But when you're the director, when you're on set and when he mm -hmm. shows up, you're in charge. Okay. And you have to have that mindset. You know, it is your set. It is your gotcha. project. This person, regardless of how, you know, big they are outside of your own personal sphere. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're a, a gun for hire for a particular job for a particular time on a particular day. And I'll give you a little example. So uh, I was prepping the kitchen scene and the very first scene on the shoot was with Trejo cool. in the kitchen. But because I knew I only had him for a limited period of time, I was, we were doing rehearsals with the other two actors in this scene. We were rehearsing the camera shots. So that way when Trail would show up, we could just, there was we wouldn't have to do any practice with him. We would just right away shoot. Right. So I'm in practice, we were in rehearsing and then uh, Trail, I, my, my first AD said, you know, Trail here, he's in the trailer, he wants to see you. So I go in the trailer and the very first thing he says to me, Because uh, he was um, he was uh, uh, supposed to be there from noon until four, and he, it was it was like eleven forty five, so he's a little bit early. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, by the way, I have nothing negative to say about Trail. 
consummate professional, amazing person to work with. He, he ate with us, you know, he was, he did not, he was not pretentious and we just had pizza, right? So he's sitting down with the whole crew at lunch, eating pizza with everybody. Right. But the very first thing he says to me, he says, uh, so I, I had to leave at three o'clock. Now that's not good because I only have him till four o'clock and I smiled and I said, well, actually we have you from noon to four. So you'll be leaving at four. Wow. And I didn't even think about that. Like I didn't mm-hmm. think about, you know, I, how do I need to reply or respond to him? That was natural reaction. And it's wow. because I, I was the director. Mm-hmm. I was on set. And wow. then he said, yeah, but I have this, he, you know, he's a busy guy. He has this other music thing because he's, he's all music labels. So he had some other event somewhere they had to be at. And I said, well, I understand. However, we have you until four o'clock and um, uh, I, I, I'll get you out four o'clock. And then he said it a third time. And then I said, maybe we'll get you out 15 minutes early if, I'm, if we're able to, but probably four <laughs> o'clock. And then he smiled and then he shook my hand. So now I don't know if, if that was a test. Or if that was, you know, the whole thing was, I don't know. Okay. But what I do know is when after that, and that was my very first interaction with him, once he showed up on set, I had complete respect from him. He followed every direction. And, you know, maybe if I had, if I had bowed down to this star, right? Right. Oh, okay, Mr. Trejo, you need to get out at three o'clock. Okay, we'll do it. Guess what? The whole shoot would have fallen apart because we wouldn't have been able to get everything we needed or I would have rushed stuff, right? No, 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 right. you're the director. So be the director. Right, wow, that's, uh, I love that advice. Very, very nice. Uh, Michael, before I let you go, let's go very quick to post-production. Uh, who edited the film and how do you work with the editor? This is a question that I like to, to filmmakers hear this. How do you work with the, with the, the editor? Um, so I, I worked, my uh, producing partner, Chase Cooker, uh, who also did the, the sound design and the music on the film, um, we did a, like a rough cut director's edit together, okay, mm-hmm. before we brought it to our editor, partly because I wanted to have that experience. Um, I, I really feel like as a director, if you wear every hat at least once, you'll have more empathy, more understanding to all the other parts. You know, like, for example, I did my own storyboard for that film. Mm-hmm. I never want to do that again, but I did it already. So in the future, like I will have better empathy and better understanding. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, yeah, so I, we did a rough cut over like three days and then I took the rough cut and I brought it to our editor, Scott uh, Rune. And, um, you know, he's a professional editor. He made everything better. Mm-hmm. The only thing he didn't improve was the kitchen sequence, which was what you see in the film is exactly how I edited it. So, um, but everything else was t- tweaked and, and, you know, improved, but, but it gave him a sense, right? So instead of me just giving him notes, I was giving him a visual product that he could, he could work with. Right. And the one part in the end where we do flashbacks and stuff, that was all our editor. I couldn't figure out how to sh- tell that story as well. And so, you know, that's why you want to, you, you, as a director, surround yourself around, you know, the most talented people as yeah. possible. That's really part of the job is hire really qualified people. Right. Yeah. Your move your movie is very smooth. The editing, I love it. You know, I just watched him before. Hey, Michael, my last question. Are you coming to Barcelona? We'd love to have I you. I hope man. so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been in Barcelona, so has my wife. Um, yeah, you told we've me. been there at different times, not together. So uh, it would be a treat for us as as a family to come together uh, and experience and it's a beautiful city. Uh, I only have positive memories of, of, of my time in Barcelona. So hopefully I can, I can have more memories holding my wife's hand. Yeah. That Who, by the way, was, was also a producer on the film. So it was a family affair. Our dog, that dog was my dog too. So. <laughs> Amazing. Hey, Michael, thank you so much. Hey, thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Hey, I'm very excited for the Spanish people to watch your film because it's beautiful, you know? Uh, you did a great the writing everything in your film is great and um, yeah thanks for the advices for all of us as a filmmaker you know that's been very helpful and looking forward to see you okay michael thank you so much okay thank you very much